So today I'm going to be reviewing a lesser known system, or at least lesser known to people who've never used Unix like myself. Now I have to warn you, you're about to learn about an awesome retro machine that is sure to get your geek juices flowing, so prepare yourselves. This is an AT&T 3B2 400 computer released around 1983. I picked it up a few weeks ago and it's in almost perfect condition and it even came with the original plastic inserts for the five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive and even one for the tape disk drive. It also came with some Unix System 5 disks which I'm sure will come in handy and also a couple manuals for the Televideo 950 which is the terminal I'm using with the computer. So as I mentioned the 3B2400 is my first exposure to a Unix system so I had to do a fair amount of research on it but I've really enjoyed learning about it and its history so let me share some of what I've learned. So it was developed by Bell Laboratories who were the R&D subsidiary of AT&T at the time and it was designed to be used internally by AT&T but it also found its way into the general business market. Now it's a 32-bit super microcomputer. It uses a Western Electronic 32100 processor which can address up to 4 gigabytes of physical and virtual memory and ran stock at 10 megahertz, although it could be increased up to 18 megahertz. It could support up to 4 megabytes of RAM and had 12 expansion slots, or 14 if you include the two memory slots. Now, these were some insane specs when you compare it to your average personal computer of the time, but make no mistake, this is not your average personal computer. It's a super microcomputer, and this meant it wasn't designed to be used by just a single user, although it certainly could be, and that's how I've been using it, because I'm special. But it's more or less a server, which could connect to dozens of terminals and be accessed by multiple users at any given time. If you look at the side of the machine, you can see it has a total of 20 standard RS-232 serial ports, all of which could connect to their own terminal. As you can see, I still have several empty slots for even more connections, and this particular model could have up to 46 users connected. Looking at the front, you can see there's two disk drives. On the bottom is a 5 and a quarter inch 720 kilobyte floppy disk drive, and above it is a 23 megabyte cartridge tape drive. Now beneath this cover there is an 86 megabyte hard drive in my machine and there's also space for a second MFM hard drive if needed. You can see how additional cards are stacked up over the motherboard and I have two RAM cards on the side. Each one is two megabytes maxing out the machine at four megabytes. Now these things were built like tanks and used only the most expensive parts of the time. Because of that the price of this machine wasn't cheap. When you think of expensive personal computers from the early 80s, the first thing that comes to mind is probably the Apple Lisa with its respectable $10,000 price tag. The 3B2400? Over $20,000. And that's not even its introductory price. I got that number from this price index and that was from 1987. Keep in mind that was after the much improved 600 model was already out with its price tag of $46,500. I don't even want to think what that price would be today adjusted for inflation. Now the 3B2 is just the computer and it requires a terminal to operate it. The one I'm using is a Televideo 950 which was released in 1980 for $1200. At the time that was one of the best terminals you could buy for that price. It's considered a smart terminal because it has built-in programmable functions and 15 special characters. The manual lists some other cool features too like its etched CRT face, 14 by 10 character resolution and it's attractive cabinet styling. Oh yeah, you know you're sexy, don't you? Now it wasn't so sexy when I first got this thing. It was actually completely covered in dust and not even working properly. But luckily it's easy to access the innards of the monitor. The cover only has four screws holding it down and the motherboard slips out from a tray similar to the old Macintoshes with no screws to deal with. The thing was covered in debris and all it really needed was a good cleaning and some reseeding of a few chips and it was running smoothly once again. So as was common back in those days, this terminal can only display ASCII characters. So text, numbers, symbols, and that's about it. But that's all you really needed for the majority of the programs people are actually using this system for. 
In this case, this terminal can also display 15 special characters by entering into the special character mode. You can also run a self-test to view all the possible display options for your text. Looking at the back, you can see there are two sets of dip switch settings which control various monitor and communication settings like the baud rate, display options, and whether a noise is produced when you strike a key. The 950 has a pretty nice keyboard too. Now, I have no idea what you're supposed to look for in a terminal keyboard, but it seems to be pretty complete. 11 function keys and a whole bunch of other special keys. And the sound is actually generated from the back of the keyboard. You can see a little speaker there, rather than the monitor. By 1982, there actually were graphics terminals you could use that supported Unix and even supported a mouse input. Here's a promotional video about the Blit terminal. It's a multi-programming graphics terminal supported by Unix. The Blit has a 68,000 microprocessor, a quarter megabyte of memory, and a standard RS-232 terminal connection, all on one small board. 100 kilobytes of the memory is visible on an 800 by 1024 dot screen. The Blit also has a keyboard and a digitizing mouse. I point to things on the screen with the mouse. I can also use the mouse to sweep out working areas instead of typing in coordinates. When I want to compile a program, I don't have to exit the editor. I just go to another layer and type make. It's just like another terminal on the same screen. Unix compilers are slow, so to entertain myself while I'm waiting, I can play Asteroids. You see? Compiler errors print out even while Asteroids is running. Unfortunately, my 3B2 didn't come with an awesome terminal like that. AT&T made a few graphics terminals in the 80s, but I have a feeling they're fairly rare, so I'm not going to be holding my breath on when I pick one up. The Televideo 950 that I have was made before the 3B2 400 and was not made by AT&T, and so a special adapter had to be made for the two machines to actually communicate with one another. Now, Steve Friedel from UnixWiz.net was actually kind enough to send me information on the pinouts and how to build such an adapter, and he even sent me the special RJ45 cable that I needed for the two machines to work. So this guy is just really awesome. Thank you again, Steve. Seriously, you rock. Okay, so everything is set up, connected, ready to go. So let's flip the switch and see what happens. Okay, so upon startup, the first thing that I saw on the screen was an error message which is never something you want to see. But in my case, I was actually happy to see that. I was happy to see anything on the screen, uh, so that was already a win. But in this case, the error message is just referring to the onboard battery, which is long dead, and that's not a big deal. I can always replace that if I wanted to. Now, the 3B2400 is slow, very slow, especially when you compare it to the later model 3B2s. After several minutes, the diagnostics are finally passed, and I'm prompted to log in. Now wait, what? Log in? As in, like, username and password? Well, okay, how the heck am I supposed to know that? Uh, well, I figured out that the username is root, but how am I supposed to know the password? Well, I don't, and the guy who sold it to me is just the dealer. He's not the original owner, so he doesn't know, and I don't know. And so, thus endeth my journey with Unix at least until I can get my hands on the maintenance boot disk so I can actually edit the password file. But you know what, I'm just happy to have this system up and running and for now I'll just stare at the login screen and pretend I'm using Unix for whatever productive reasons I would use an old Unix system. Uh, come to think of it, what was I going to use this system for? I have no idea. I know there's actually a few games written for it, if you can believe that. Uh, ASCII display games. Uh, notably Rogue, which spawned its own series of roguelike games which were ported to other systems. But that will have to wait for another day. So thank you for watching.